Welcome to Chapter 14, Juvenile Corrections. Two major categories of treatment exist for juveniles. It's community treatment and institutional treatment. So community treatment provides care, protection, and treatment. It includes probation and treatment services such as counseling, restitution, or other programs. Here are some examples on the slide. And then institutional treatment is where facilities are correctional centers operated by federal, state, and county governments. They restrict the movement of residents, they have locked exits, and interior fence controls. Different facilities, including reception centers that screen juveniles, specialized facilities for specific care, drug treatment, training schools, ranch or forestry camps, and boot camps can all be part of that. Some experts believe that any hope for rehabilitating juvenile offenders and resolving the problems of crime lies in these community treatment centers. Juvenile probation refers to non-punitive legal dispositions for youth, emphasizing treatment without any incarceration. And the primary form of community treatment that's used by the juvenile justice system is probation. And what we know um, happens, it is really characterized by um, this establishment of um, rules. And when applied correctly, probation maximizes the liberty of the, ju of the individual and at the same time vindicates the authority of the law and protects the public. Probation promotes rehabilitation by maintaining normal community contacts and the negative effects of confinement, and it also reduces cost. So how did it start? The historical development um, really started as a development um, or excuse me, a wave of social reform. Probation was the cornerstone in the development of the juvenile court system. It expanded, and by the mid-1960s, juvenile probation had become a complex institution. Many reformers believed that confinement could actually amplify delinquency. What a concept. So can, as far as with contemporary juvenile probation, the use has really increased significantly since 2002, with 300,339,700 adjudicated youths that were placed on probation. Remember, adjudicated means, um, like, convicted. It's just how we use that word in the juvenile courts. So in recent years, this number has remained relatively stable. So there are arguments, of course, for and against probation for juveniles. But as far as uh, arguments in favor of it, um, we know that it represents appropriate disposition. It allows the court to tailor a program to each offender, which is important because every juvenile is going to be different. The system will continue to have confidence and rehabilitation in that juvenile while accommodating demands for legal controls and protection. And it's often the disposition of choice, particularly for status offenders, those ones who are um, the nonviolent crimes. So there are conditions for probation, um, and these are the rules that mandate that juveniles behave in a certain way. Um, it can be restitution or um, intensive counseling, vocational training. There are a number of conditions that could go into play. Um, and it can also be ordered for an indefinite period of time, so just as a means to follow the juvenile. So courts insist that probationers lead law-abiding lives, they maintain a residence, refrain from associating with certain types of people, and they are often asked to remain in a certain area. Courts have invalidated probation conditions that are harmful or, valid, or violate the juvenile's due process. <clears throat> courts can also revoke probation if the juvenile commits another offense, um, and they are entitled to legal representation and a hearing when violations occur. 
So let's talk about the duties of the juvenile probation officers. So these officers are involved in four stages of the court process. There's intake, predisposition, post adjudication, and post disposition. And these treatment plans are really going to vary in approach and structure based on each case um, and the juvenile being worked with. And um, they can perform a broad range of functions which require extensive training. Many of those probation officers um, have legal and social work backgrounds or special counseling skills. So there's been many new programs that have uh, come around that are part of probation. And so we're going to go through a, th a few of these. Um, they developed really to add a control dimension to community corrections. It's kind of viewed as probation plus, and it's got some restrictive penalties and conditions. So the first is intensive supervision. This is often known as GIPS, Juvenile Intensive Probation Supervision. And this is where juveniles um, are, you know, under daily scrutiny. Um, this would normally be the type of offender that would have to be sent to a secure treatment facility. But really, the primary goal of this is decarceration. And of course, the second goal is control. We want to always remember how we're going to help that juvenile maintain community ties and reintegration into society post adjudication. There's also electronic monitoring and this is the active monitoring systems with the radio transmitters that are worn by the offenders and there's computer generated random phone calls um, some might call this house arrest. Um, so oftentimes they put house arrest, um, which is where an offender is required to stay home during sp specific periods of time. And again, this will be monitored by random phone calls and visits. One that I love is restorative justice. And the core values in restorative justice is that the offense is against some sort of human relationship. The victims in the community are central, really, to the justice process. Uh, the first priority is to assist the victims, and the second priority is to restore the community. The offender is going to develop um, some improved competency and understanding and the stakeholders get to share some responsibilities for the restorative justice through partnerships for action. In an effort to enhance the success of probation, this approach integrates community protection, accountability of the offender, and individualized attention to the offender. Juveniles must accept responsibility for their actions and have an obligation to society. Now, restitution, the process with, oops, the process with restitution, we know it can take on several forms, and that's going to be monetary victim services and community service um, and other forms of restitution. It does show that it's reasonably effective when used correctly. So residential community treatment is where youth are placed under probation supervision and the probation department maintains a residential treatment facility. These can be divided into four different categories. Residential programs where juveniles are closely monitored and develop close relationships with staff members. And then we have group homes, which are non-secured structured residents. They provide counseling, education, job training, and family living. Foster care programs are placements with families who provide attention, guidance, and care. And then family group homes are kind of a combination of foster care and group homes run by a single family rather than professional staff. A judge may then refer a juvenile to a secure treatment program when the court determines that community treatment cannot meet the special needs of the delinquent.
So until the early 1800s, juvenile offenders were confined to adult prisons. Social reformers created a separate child court system in 1899. The first juvenile court in 1899 reflected the expanded use of confinement for delinquent children. The U.S. Children's Bureau sought to reform juvenile corrections. Since the 1970s, a major change in the institutionalization has been the effort to remove status offenders from institutions that house juvenile delinquents. The decarceration policy mandates that courts use the least restrictive alternative. In the 1980s and into the 1990s, admissions to juvenile correction facilities grew substantially. A 1994 report by OJJDP said that crowding, inadequate health care, lack of security, and poor control of suicidal behavior was widespread in juvenile corrections facilities. Sorry, I got behind on the notes. So there are some trends that we should probably talk about when we're talking about juvenile institutions today, and that's going to be the differences between a public and a private institution. So most status offenders are held in private facilities. In 2013, less than 53,000 juvenile offenders were in public and private facilities in the U.S. Juvenile's health and custody reached its peak in 2000 and has decreased by 50% through 2013. So with the physical conditions um, changing, um, they often vary in size and quality, and there usually is individual living areas as well. So when we're talking about the institutionalized juvenile, the typical resident is a 15 or 16 year old male from a racial ethnic minority group. Minority youths are incarcerated at a, at a rate of two to four times that of European American youths. Among the minority groups, African American youths are most likely to receive more punitive treatment throughout the juvenile justice system. And today, more than 7 in 10 juveniles in custody belong to race, racial and ethnic minorities. Most of the bulk of institutionalized youth, 7 out of every 8 juvenile offenders, are in residential placement for male inmates. Inmates have their own inmate value system and adhere to an informal inmate culture. With female inmates, the number of female offenders has increased by 57%. Attention to female youth has revealed a double standard of justice. Girls are more likely than boys to be incarcerated for status offenses and have fewer educational programs and fewer services. And they tend to be incarcerated for longer terms than males. I think we will stop now and get into correctional treatment for juveniles in the next part of the lecture.